Welcome, everyone. We are here because of Jesus to get to know him better, to experience his presence in our lives. So to move us toward that, I'm gonna pray first and then the worship team is gonna lead us in praise. Let's pray. Jesus, we are here to know you better and to experience your presence in our lives. Speak to us, let us know and feel what we, each individual needs to know and feel today from you. Lord, I ask for you to meet the needs of those who are here. I ask for you to grant them peace in every situation of life. And Lord, again, we are here to know you better, to experience your presence in our lives as we worship and honor you, not only now during this service, but throughout the week. In your name, amen. That saves a wretch like me I once was lost But now am found Was blind But now I see so clearly Yeah. 
Welcome again to Holly Church Online. If you're watching this live on Sunday, April 11th, do you know what Sunday this is? It's a little bit obscure, but it does make perfect sense. It's Octave Sunday, and Octave means eight, and it's eight days since Jesus rose from the dead. It's eight days from Easter Sunday. Now, eight's a good number. Do you have a favorite number? A lot of people do have a favorite number. If you have a favorite number, let me know what it is in the chat or in the comments. And a lot of people have a reason why it's their favorite number. And if you'd like to share that with me, that'd be awesome. I'd like to know a little bit more about you and learn why it's your favorite number. I've got another little interesting tidbit about Octave Sunday that I'll share with you later in the service. If this is your first time with us at Holly Church, I have a free gift for you. I'd like to send out a book co-written by me called Unshakable. And it's just our way of thanking you for being here. And all you need to do to receive your free gift is go to Holly Church Online and fill out your connection card there. If you're already at Holly Church Online, you're all set. If you're on one of our social media sites, you can leave that page up and open a new tab to go to Holly Church Online where you can experience this worship service as well. You can fill out your connection card there. And not only that, you can send us prayer requests, praises from there. You can chat with us. You can access message notes for today's message. And you can give from Holly Church Online as well. And the connection card that's there is really for everyone to fill out because there's next steps there for you to take to grow spiritually this week. And you'll also often find ways on that connection card that you can connect with your Holly Church family. Now, I promise to tell you one more obscure thing about Octave Sunday. Well, a famous fictional character who we now know, maybe based on a real person, is named after Octave Sunday. He's a tragic character. Who is he? Quasimodo, the hunchback of Notre Dame. Now you're seeing a picture of him of the Disney version, but Quasimodo is Octave Sunday in Latin. Now you know how he got his unusual name, the bell ringer of Notre Dame Church. The worship team is going to continue to lead our hearts to focus on Jesus, and then I'll be back with today's message. All throughout my history, faithfulness is walked beside me.
the first three words of the Bible, Genesis 1-1, are in the beginning. Then it continues, God created the heavens and the earth. The first three words of the gospel, and gospel means the good news story of Jesus, the first three words of the gospel according to John are, John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning. And then John continues, was the word. The word is a term John uses to describe Jesus. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And the man who wrote these words, the apostle, the word apostle means one sent. Jesus chose a few men to send out after his return to heaven to tell about him, the Messiah, the good news story that people can be saved from their sins and be restored to eternity in heaven. And John was one of Jesus' closest friends. He wasn't only one of the apostles. He was in the inner circle of apostles, which included only two others, his brother James and the apostle Peter. These three men see and experience life with Jesus more than anyone else. John is able to witness things that others did not get to see. John is considered by Jesus to be a part of his family. So as he's hanging on the cross dying, Jesus entrusts his mother Mary to John's care. John knows who Jesus is and carefully chooses his words and his sentence structures when he begins writing about Jesus. He purposefully ties Jesus back to creation to make it clear Jesus is the creator God who has always existed. Unsurprisingly, people who do not claim to be Christians have a real problem recognizing Jesus as God. They have such a problem, some of them, some of them, they're just so obsessed with Jesus or so at work for evil that now in our current culture, many of them say this, well, Jesus was just a made-up person. And this lie has been repeated so often that sadly, many are falling for it that Jesus wasn't a real person. The truth and the reality is nearly all credible historians, whether they're Christians or not Christians, say Jesus was a real person of history. Even world-famous atheist Richard Dawkins grudgingly admits Jesus was a real person of history. So no matter how many times someone might claim Jesus is made up or he's just a figment of your imagination, he walked this earth. He was a real person. And while doing so, he clearly claimed to be God. There was no doubt by those who saw and heard Jesus in person that he claimed to be God in the flesh. Jesus' enemies, the Jewish leaders, certainly understood Jesus was making himself equal with God, and it's why they condemned him to die. Mark chapter 14, verses 61 through 64. But Jesus kept quiet and did not say a word. The high priest asked him another question. Are you the Messiah, the son of the glorious God? Yes, I am. Jesus answered, soon you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right side of God all-powerful and coming with the clouds of heaven. At once the high priest ripped his robe apart and shouted, why do we need more witnesses? You heard him claim to be God. What is your decision? They all agreed that he should be put to death. Now Jesus could have avoided the death penalty by just telling them, oh no, no, I, I'm just a man, I'm not God. But he doesn't. He seals his fate to die on a cross by telling them who he is, God right there on earth with them. Now, some who don't try to deny that Jesus was a real person still try to deny that Jesus is God. And they'll say things like, well, I believe Jesus was probably a real person of history and maybe he was a good guy, I don't really know. And maybe he taught some good things. He probably knew a few magic tricks and he got some followers around him and then he ended up getting himself killed. And he certainly wasn't God and he didn't walk out of that tomb alive unless, of course, he wasn't really dead. And there's some really elaborate theories out there about how Jesus wasn't really dead. He just was pretending to be dead. 
And so he was able to get up and walk out of the tomb, or he was helped out of the tomb, and then he healed up. And you can say those types of things, of course, in an attempt to avoid the reality of who Jesus actually says he is, but you can't do so in good conscience because Jesus doesn't give us that option of just saying, hey, he was a good guy. Theologian and author C.S. Lewis put it this way, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. John doesn't argue about Jesus being divine. He doesn't skirt around the issue or even try to explain how it works, Jesus being God in the flesh. John just says there was something before the beginning of the universe and that something was God and that something had no beginning. God has always been and Jesus is God. So let's look at who John, and remember John is one of his closest followers. Let's look at who John says Jesus is and what that means for you and and for me. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the eternal God. That's what John begins with. Jesus is the eternal God. That's why he ties it back to Genesis 1.1. Now, this concept of an eternal, uncreated God who has existed for an infinite amount of time is difficult for us to comprehend. Infinity itself is super difficult for us to really comprehend. For example, imagine a hotel, and it has an infinite number of rooms with an infinite number of guests. And it's full, it's filled up. But then you show up at the hotel and you're really tired and you want a room and the accommodating hotel manager says, sure, I can move move you right into room number one. I'll just ask the other folks to move to the next room and so forth because you're really tired. And you move into room number one. Now, how many times could this scenario occur and the hotel still have room for more? Well, the answer is it could reoccur infinite number of times. Now imagine half the guests decide to leave. You know, you leave because you're upset. Well, it was great when I was in room number one, but now I got to change rooms every 10 minutes. So you leave and half the other people leave. Will there still be an infinite number of people in the hotel? The answer is yes there would still be an infinite number of people in the hotel. Affinity is very hard for us to grasp. So when we think of a God who has existed in all eternity with no beginning and no end, our minds just sort of start to crash. But just as in mathematics classes, students are very simply and matter-of-factly taught that a number line goes on to infinity. It has no limit. You can just keep making those tick marks forever in both directions, forward and backwards. So too, John simply states in his first sentence that before anything else was, God was and will always be. The concept of an eternal God is taught all throughout the Bible. And it's often used to encourage trust in God. He is faithful and his faithful love endures forever. He cannot die. He will not break down. He will not fade away. He will not cease to exist. John's statement that Jesus preexisted before he was born in Bethlehem and before even the universe was created points to his identity as being God himself in the flesh. John the Baptist, Jesus' older cousin, recognizes Jesus' divinity and says this, John 1.15, John the Baptist testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, this is the one I was talking about when I said, someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. Jesus himself says, John 8.58, Before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus says, I 
am a total of eight times in the Gospel of John. When Jesus says, I am, he is literally saying, I am Yahweh, God's personal name that's revealed to us in the Bible. I am the eternal father. I am the creator God. I am the Lord of heaven and earth. He, Jesus, claims to be God and not just a God, but the God of all creation. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the eternal God. And this is what it means for you. He is someone you can trust. Someone you can count on. When Jesus says, I am with you always, he means I will always be there. I am eternal. I will be with you. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Word. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and through Him all things came into being. Equating Jesus with God, who spoke the planets, the stars, and galaxies into existence, clearly demonstrates John's insistence on the absolute divinity, power, and authority of Jesus. Calling Jesus the Word seems a little strange to us or sounds a little strange to us, right? Hey, Word. But it wouldn't have sounded strange to those readers that John is originally writing to. John is writing to those who grew up going to synagogues, those who are a, a part of his Israelite heritage. And they would immediately recognize the usage of the Word and tying it to eternity. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. It has no beginning, has no end. John also writes to a culture dominated by Greek philosophy, Greek thinking, Greek teaching. Heraclitus, a Greek philosopher, using the same word as the apostle John says, the word is the omnipresent Everywhere, that means everywhere. The word is the omnipresent wisdom by which all things are steered. So John is using perfect language to describe who Jesus is to the culture that he's writing to. Jesus is the living, breathing embodiment of eternal truth who steers creation. Now how John words everything and structures everything is what the Bible calls being inspired by the Holy Spirit as he's writing. And by the way, the oldest portion of the book of John that we have that's in existence is only from 70 to 130 years after Jesus' resurrection to life. And John writes his book originally sometime between 70 and 90 AD. So we have a part of his book from that very same time period that he is writing it. And the book, John's Gospel, and again, Gospel means the good news story about Jesus. John's Gospel is the last one to be written out of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These Gospels were not written 100 years or 200 years or 300 years later after Jesus' life here on earth as critics of Jesus claim and they claim, well, the myth of Jesus just grew up over time. There is no myth of Jesus because his story was being written shortly after he was here on earth. Mark, the first gospel to be written, was completed within 10 to 20 years from Jesus being here. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Word. And this is what that means for you. He is the one who spoke creation into existence, and yet he is so close, he knows every detail about you and still chooses to care for you, love you. When Jesus says, cast all your anxiety on me because I care for you, he means he really cares for you. 
Not what you can do for him. Not what you can offer him or give to him. No. He cares for you. Who is Jesus? He is the Word. He is the eternal God. And Jesus is the man. Literally, the man. John pulls no punches in making sure we understand Jesus is God. Jesus is divine. But then, he also makes it just as clear, John 1.14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The divine became human, fully human. Jesus didn't just look human or limit himself to being sort of like humans. Nope. Jesus was completely human. When we say Jesus is both fully human and fully God, this is not some play on words or a puzzle that we're supposed to figure out. Jesus is actually and simultaneously both God and man. And again, like God being eternal and God being infinite, this is something our brains struggle to grasp, to comprehend. But just because we struggle understanding something doesn't mean it's not true. Who does Jesus speak to when he prays? God the Son is praying to God the Father. Who is Jesus speaking to when he hangs on the cross? God the Son is speaking to God the Father. The Holy Spirit is also God, and yet there is only one God, not three. It's just beyond us to know how that works, but it's not beyond God. And our God who is gracious and our God who is compassionate knows we need to see him in a way that we relate to. So Jesus is the ultimate expression of God's compassion and God's graciousness. And because Jesus is fully human, he, God, can fully sympathize with us in our temptations and our struggles and our joys. Jesus knows what it's like to be single and childless. He knows what it's like to be hurt and hungry. He knows the shame and helplessness of abuse. He knows temptation. He knows the blessing and the pain of family. He knows happiness. He knows sadness. He knows celebration. We should treasure Jesus' humanity because we have someone who pleads for us in God the Father's presence. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with <clears throat> our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. So we should treasure Jesus' humanity, and we should treasure Jesus' divinity, his godhood, because it is only through his divinity that Christ is able to live without sin and die on behalf of all of us. Only God's blood is valuable enough to restore all creation from the effects of sin. How does all this work? I don't know. He's God. And Jesus can't be reduced to fit our thinking, what we can comprehend. Knowing who Jesus is means having our assumptions and our misconceptions revised and changed. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the man. And this is what that means for you. He is the one who knows what it is like to be you. He knows what it is like to have skin. And so he walks with you every day of your life if you invite him to do so. When Jesus says, pick up your cross daily and follow me, he's saying that because he wants to, you to give yourself completely to him so he can completely invest himself in you. Who is Jesus? He is the man. He is the word. He is the eternal God. A creed 
is a statement of belief that's intended to be memorized. This is a Christian creed from East Africa. It's a bit of a fresh take for us on who Jesus is. We believe that God made good as promised by sending his son, Jesus Christ, a man in the flesh of the tribe of Judah, born poor in a little village who left his home and was always on safari doing good, curing people by the power of God, teaching about God and man, showing the meaning of religion as love. He was rejected by his people, tortured and nailed, hands and feet to a cross, and he died. He lay buried in the grave, but the hyenas did not touch him. And on the third day, he rose from the grave. He ascended to the skies. He is the Lord, this we believe. He is the Lord. That statement means Jesus is God. This we believe. If you believe Jesus is the eternal God, if you believe Jesus is the word, if you believe Jesus is the man, say that out loud with me wherever you are. You ready? He is Lord. Let's pray. Now, I'm going to pray out loud, but I would encourage you to make this prayer yours and pray it silently along with me. Jesus, I don't really even pretend to understand exactly how you are both fully God and fully human, but I don't have to. I don't have to understand that because you came here out of love. You came here to buy me back from sin and death. So thank you. And help me remember daily that you're never going to leave me, that you care for me, and that you completely know what it's like to be me. May your will always be done in my life. Amen. You can give to support the work of Holly Church online at hollychurch.org. If you're on Holly Church online, you just click on the Give tab. It opens up a brand new page. All of our giving options are listed on the screen, and I just want to thank you so much for your financial gifts. It's been an awesome Octave Sunday, and next week I'll be sharing a message about free will and God's plan for our lives. Did Judas really have a choice when he decided to betray Jesus, or was it out of his control? Do you have the ability to make choices, or is your life totally out of your hands? That's next week. In the meantime, have a great week.